When he was five years old, Pastor Lorenzo Venegas claims he spoke to a strange woman with black eyes who came from somewhere else. Chilean paranormal investigator Robert Vettiger spoke to Venegas about the bizarre encounter which occurred at his parents' house in Rancagua. From a very early age, Venegas remembered how strange things would happen around the house, including the day he and his brothers were visited by a woman dressed all in white with braided black hair and with eyes that were completely black. The children referred to her as the white lady because her skin was so pale, like a dead person. She always wore the same slightly worn out white dress. Despite her odd appearance, Lorenzo also recalled that the children felt no fear in her presence. They told the parents of the black eyed woman, but they brushed it off as just their imagination. Venegas ultimately concluded that the adults probably could not see her, although the children could, and they did, numerous times. She would come around from time to time, and the children began to learn a little bit more about her, including a hint about where she came from, as well as other bizarre things. Venegas recalled how one day they asked her if they could hug her, but she was adamant that they could not touch her because if they did, she would get sick and she would not be able to return and play with them. When Lorenzo's younger brother asked her where she lived, she looked up at the sun and said that it was very far beyond the sun. When one of the children asked, how do you travel back and forth from your home? She answered simply, I think of being there and I am there. Then I think of being here and here I appear. She was crying the last time Venegas saw her. He asked her what was wrong, and the strange woman told him that she was leaving because they no longer needed her, and that she no longer had permission to play with them. Over the years, people for whom Venegas told of the strange woman believed that it was a demon, but Lorenzo doubted this. At no point in any of these meetings did he get the sense that she was evil or had malicious intent. I want to thank Albert Rosales, uh, for bringing this case to my attention. There are many facets of this case that I find interesting. Like who, or rather what was this woman? It's curious that the children described her as pale, like a dead person. Legendary Fordian researcher John Keel spoke of an encounter with a female he nicknamed the librarian, who was always clad in the same worn out dress, like in this case, and who also appeared to be dead. Another interesting aspect of the case, one that ties into more famous accounts of Counters with black eyed beings, as related by David Weatherly, Lon Strickler, Jason Off, and a whole bunch of others, is the sickness factor. In numerous reports, people who claim to encounter these strange entities often talk of how they became extremely ill not long afterwards. In a bit of a twist, the woman claimed that she, not them, would become sick if they touched, so who knows? One of the strangest parts of the story is how she claims she was able to move from one place to another by mere thought. In a dream state, we too can maneuver vast distances by mere thought. One has to wonder, does our world exist as a type of dream state to beings, say from other worlds or dimensions, possibly the afterlife? Her claim that she lived far beyond the sun, that she no longer had permission to stay and was not needed, opens a whole other round of questions, namely who sent her, why, and what was her task, and how was it resolved? So much of this case is just absolutely bizarre. While Venegas doesn't believe that he encountered a demon, for a brother and sister living in Ventura, California, they are quite convinced that's exactly what they saw. In 2006, Dakota and her brother were walking home from a Mexican restaurant not far from their home. They had cut through the alleyway. That's when they noticed, on their right, a figure perched in a tree. Not surprisingly, they thought it was strange, but they continued on towards home. So we just keep talking and it sort of jumped out of the tree and it like landed right at the base of the tree and it straightened up. It was about six feet tall. Dakota claims that the entity was pure black and looked like a really tall thin human, but with a canine face. It was terrifying and it had these big, like those mountain goats. It had big horns like mountain goats and it had these really long fingers. It was kind of hunched over, but I could just like feel it look into my soul. I honestly don't know what it was. Two siblings became frightened and averted their gaze as if unable to cope with what they were seeing. They quickly broke for home. We are talking about whatever we could talk about to not even acknowledge it. And so we turned the corner and right at the corner where we were going, there's this building that had a tin roof and we could hear it land on the top of the roof. And as we were turning the corner, 
we could hear it turning the corner of the roof with us. So we just sort of looked at each other and we both just started running all the way home. Neither Dakota nor her brother ever saw the entity again and to this day they have no idea what they encountered that night. I don't put a lot of merit into religious things personally but I always thought that that could have been a demon. The being as defined by Dakota was pure black, tall, thin, with a canine face and horns. It certainly lines up with how people depict demons in religious texts. So one has to wonder what exactly it was and what was it doing there. Was it a demon? Was it a, a misidentified animal? Who knows? From the description, it also sounds like whatever this thing was, it was hunting them. But why? Uh, what, what was it planning to do if it was to catch them? Um, I don't know. It's interesting that in Madison County, North Carolina, another very strange horned entity was reported. This account appeared in the March 12, 1873 edition of the Fairfield Herald. It was 10 years after the Shelton Laurel Massacre in which 13 Union sympathizers were executed. A man from Shelton wrote to the Herald about how people in the densely thicketed county were encountering a huge mountain monster, the species of which was unknown. Laurel County resident George Anderson provided a description of what happened. I was out in the bush hunting up some lost hogs, when all of a sudden there came into my path a beast of the appearance of which, I must confess, caused me to quake for the first time in many years. Aside from its strange and unusual appearance, the unearthly yell it uttered on perceiving me, which reverberated and reverberated through the forest, was enough to shake the senses of the most daring adventurer. Anderson claims the creature was standing about a hundred yards away. He described it as a huge black bear with a mane and head like a lion but with horns on its head like an elk. Its tail was long and bushy with dark and light rings around it. He claimed that its eyes gleamed like a panther's and his size was that of an ordinary ox, but somewhat longer. Prior to his encountering the creature, Anderson had just fired at a squirrel and wasn't prepared for what he saw. He immediately set about reloading his rifle as the creature darted towards him. Terrified, Anderson took off running. The creature followed him briefly, but eventually veered off into the forest. Mr. Anderson was adamant that the story he told was true. I am not the only one who has seen the monster. Several have seen it since I did, and as sheep and calves are lately missing, it is presumed to be a carnivorous brute. Many have fortified their house to prevent a night attack from the strange monster the like of which is never seen in these mountains before. So what to make of this creature? A black bear with a head and a mane like a lion, and with horns the size of an ox with a bushy tail. Was this just a misidentified animal or was it something else? On February 11, 1972, two young boys tobogganing in northern Minnesota claimed they encountered a strange entity in the forest. What it actually was, nobody knows, but the main witness is convinced that it was a legendary Wendigo monster. Brian Sullivan, who was 10 years old at the time, claims that he and his friend Dave were back in the hills sledding one Friday afternoon following school. They had made two runs each. Atop the hill, Brian was readying to make another run, but he sensed something behind him. He turned around and was confronted by something very peculiar. When it was my turn, I was up the top and I put my little sled down. I had a five or six foot rut right up to the edge of this really steep first hill. And I looked back behind me and all that was on this hill was just barren hardwood trees, mostly smaller ones, a few poplars, and there was one really huge black spruce that was about 40 feet away from me. I turned around. I was about to jump on my sled, but something just didn't seem right. So I turned back and I looked again. I'm like, something just looks different. And again, something in the back of my head went, that's just not right. That's not right. At this point, Brian noticed something odd about the black spruce tree. It had three trunks. He found that strange. As he focused in on the trunks, he realized that the two extra trunks were hairy, long gray hair. They were legs. He immediately assumed they were snow pants and that he was being pranked by one of his friends. So I looked up above to where, you know, a teenager or even an adult would be, like maybe five or six feet, but there was just pine branches there. Then I noticed rustling up above that about three more feet. 
So I looked up above that, and up at nine feet, there was this face looking at me. Sullivan claims the entity was peering at him through some branches, which it was holding apart with its clawed hands. Holding one branch apart at the top and the bottom, peering down at me, and it went, and it grinned, and its face did not look even remotely human. It had a flat nose with two little slits. It had a big, thick brow ridge, receding forehead. When it grinned, I could see all of its teeth. It had upper and lower canine in all of its teeth, in its mouth in the front that I could see were all sharp. So it was obvious to me that this thing was a predator. Frightened, Sullivan jumped on his sled and went down the hill as fast as he could. His friend, who was making his way up the hill, saw the look of terror in his eyes and immediately followed him down the hill. Upon returning to his house, Sullivan almost instantly forgot what happened. The event was so traumatizing that it would take him nearly two years for his memory of the event to return in full. Over time, Sullivan came to believe that it was a Wendigo that he encountered that day. He discounts the notion that it was a bear, as he was familiar with bears. They are not 9 feet tall, with 8 to 10 inch grayish white hair, especially in Minnesota. Although it did have claws on its hand, which is another thing that threw me. It took me years to figure that one out because all Bigfoots they show, including Patty, didn't have claws or anything like that. It took me a long time to research, but the Eastern Bigfoot, the Wendigo type, actually does have claws. If one is to believe Sullivan's story, it certainly sounds like he was being stalked, as he said that when he observed the entity hiding behind the trees, it was only 40 feet away from where he was standing. One has to wonder what might have happened to Brian if he was out there by himself. What would have happened had he not become aware of its presence and it was able to get even closer? Would he be just another missing persons case? Another entry in David Politis' compilation of managed people? From the snow-covered forest of Minnesota to a darkened bedroom in the town of Cornwall in Prince Edward Island, Canada, strange beings are making themselves known to people. Unlike Sullivan's nine-foot-tall grinning monster, this entity arrived calmly in the night wearing a coat and a hat. It was January 10, 2016. The witness and her husband were asleep in their beds just after midnight. The witness was feeling restless and was deciding whether or not to get up and watch some television. She claims that as she sat in bed debating what to do, somebody appeared in the hallway leading into the bedroom, only about 20 feet away from her. He was dressed entirely in black, black hat, black pants, and a black coat. She watched as the strange man walked into the room turned and continued along the front of the bed where she saw the profile of him. She claims that he was very thin, had a long oval head, teardrop shaped and long fingers. His skin tone was very white and he had round eyes and a small thin nose and a mouth with no lips. She continued watching as he walked up to the other side of the bed where her husband was. He bent down over her husband. At that moment the figure jolted back up in a standing position. He looked directly at the witness, apparently surprised. She spoke to the man, who quickly turned and walked through the wall. The witness noted that she and her husband had switched sides of the beds two nights earlier, so she believes that this entity was expecting to find her sleeping there, hence his surprise. Even stranger, the woman claims that throughout the entire experience she felt no fear. In fact, she noted that she felt comfort in its presence. Her dogs, who were sleeping in the room at the time, made no effort to attack the strange man who entered the room, as if they too were placed in a type of trance-like state. Was this just an example of sleep paralysis, or was it more? The entity she describes sounds like the Hat Man, but it also sounds like an alien. Um, is it possible that it was a, an MIB, like a man in black, as they people describe him looking the way this one looks? So. Maybe he was uh, an MIB and he was coming to check on uh, an abductee, or maybe he was uh, arriving to do something else, maybe, you know, assist in an abduction. Who knows? There was another case in which a hat man was uh, seen in conjunction with a possible UFO. It uh, occurred in 1991 in Belgrade, Serbia. The witness contacted noted author and paranormal researcher Heidi Hollis in 2015. She was 33 years old. Witness claims that this event happened when she was nine. She and her brother, who was four at the time, were laying in their parents' bed watching television. Behind the TV was the balcony. They lived on the second floor of an apartment, and there was no access to the balcony from the ground. All of a sudden, there was a really bright, blinding light coming from somewhere outside. 
and there was a tall, dark shadow appearing from the light. We could clearly see a hat. He just stood there, and we both got really scared. I don't know what happened after that, or for how long. I just know the fear was unbearable. The event traumatized the woman, who admitted having to sleep with the lights on and having an overwhelming fear of the dark. She believes that she mentally blocked out what happened and notes that she has never seen the entity again. While it's possible that this experience was a sleep paralysis episode, what if it wasn't? 